Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Print Reading. Today we're going to be doing a follow-up video on the previous video where we were looking at an addition to a house. So for those of you new to this series, I have about 15 so far videos. I'll leave uh, links into that in the description below and I would encourage you to click on the subscribe icons and the notifications icons so that you can keep up to date with new videos as I produce them. I'm a professor of construction management and I've been teaching a long time. I've been working with a lot of uh, larger companies consulting over the last 25 years with them. So I think there's a lot that I can help you with if you're new to the construction industry and trying to get into it, or if you're fairly experienced and there's things that maybe you have gaps on. Um, so check my playlists. I've got videos on project management, planning and scheduling, on MS project, on construction business management, site management. There's quite a few different on the ones on the playlist. All right, so let's get started. So this was a addition to a house. We looked at the site plan a little bit last session. So again, you can go back to that video on that. Uh, you know, the Northern orientation, there's this addition that's going on to the house here. And these are uh, Toronto Area Chief Building Official Committee um, drawings that kind of want to sort of tie to the building code. Uh, they are in metric, so if you're in the U.S., that'll be the, the one difference there. But I think I can uh, connect on all those points imperial, given I'm very imperial oriented myself. Uh, so we have the addition. This is the foundation plan. I thought I'd take a little bit of time on this particular video, um, taking a look at that. And so we've got a few things. We can see there's a cutting plane line here called A. And you can see the A drops back to about here. So that means it's gonna cut through the structure somewhere here and be looking at it in this direction. So it'll be looking at it in the direction of the point on the arrow. So there'll be a, a section AA later in the drawings. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we have that cut through. It'll cut through this deck here. All right, so this wooden deck that's on the outside shown uh, sort of dashed lines because it's a little bit higher than this cut through here. And we see these hexagon symbols, one, two, three, four, five, six sides to it. And it's got numbers. So this will save you a lot of time when reviewing drawings if you have this sort of hexagon reference symbols, which a lot of drawings do have that. Not all drawings, but a lot of them do. And that just tells you, hmm, what is this referring to, right? I want more information because designers don't want to put or they shouldn't want to put a lot of writing on what's going on where the actual objects are because then it confuses the drawing and you don't really see everything. There's already enough writing that goes on as it is. So we try to minimize that. So that reference then, number two, is going to refer to the construction notes. And so we can slide down here till we get to the construction notes and we see it over here and then we see number two all right so the construction notes or construction specifications and if I can zoom that in a little bit here so that you can read it perhaps so it talks about the foundation wall because we're in the foundation plan so just down through here it says bitumous damp proofing on minimum six millimeter parging on concrete block foundation wall. Top block course filled with mortar or concrete. Provide parging cover over poured concrete footing to bear on undisturbed soil. It's talking about the footing. All right, so this is talking, the first part here is talking about the damp proofing. And this next part is talking about the placement of the footing and it's saying to be placed on undisturbed soil. If you place it on disturbed soil, it's not fully compacted. Undisturbed soil has been compacted over thousands of years with the pressure of the ground on it. Uh, disturbed soil is, maybe it was excavated a few years back and filled in, and so it's not fully compacted. So that means it's gonna settle when you pour your house on top of it. We wanna build on top of strong foundations. So bear on undisturbed soil, provide drainage layer. We're back to the damp proofing here. Minimum five, it talks about all this stuff. Nobody ever does this, but then it talks about a BMEC approved drainage layer material. Everybody does that. It's more or less of a, 
uh, beadboard, which I'll show you some pictures on. So let's take a, a couple of pictures of what that's kind of talking about. But it is talking about a concrete block foundation. So we'll take a look at this and see what's going on here. This is not the same one as the drawings, but it gives an indication of what we're, the drawings are talking about. So it's asking for found concrete block foundation wall. And usually if you're doing a foundation wall with concrete block and northern United States, most of Canada, you're going to be going down minimum four feet below grade, all of Canada, pretty much. minimum four feet below grade to beat the frost level right so that frost doesn't get underneath the footings southern u.s different story you don't get the same kind of frost levels you don't have to go down as far uh, but we have to go down at least four feet and we have a basement so that house that we have well even if we weren't going because of the frost level we have an existing basement so what we want to do is we want to go down and in this case match the actual level of the existing basement so very often that takes you down more than four feet, but you have to be minimum four feet, which is about 1220, uh, 1,220 millimeters. So that is blocks. Now look at all the joints there. So there's a lot of joints. I don't think I would trust that too much to keep the water out of my foundation. Plus they're hollow, unless there was some sort of coating that I put on the outside of the block. And when we, when we do it with poured concrete, like most new houses, they'll use poured concrete. You can still use blocks, it's fine. Uh, as long as you do proper damp proofing on it, it can last, well, we've got in Toronto, we've got houses that are hundreds of years old that, well, maybe not hundreds, but a hundred years old that have had block. Usually you get back around a hundred years, they start using brick for foundation. We've got lots of those that even use brick for foundations. And they have a lot more joints and a lot, more issues if they're not damp proof properly but if they are they're fine so you can see down here there's a bit of mortar that spilled out but that part that's sticking out here that's the footing so the blocks are resting on the footing and the footing is going to be wider than the block so if you're using 12 inch block the footing is going to be wider because it's got to distribute that load over a bigger space so those specifications are then talking about parging so what is parging parging means you're putting a coat based on, on over the concrete block to seal up all of those joints, right? So you're usually gonna parge on about a quarter to three eighths of an inch of a, a cement based uh, mortar that is going to cover that surface. And usually you're gonna use like a um, type N type mortar, which is very resilient in underground surfaces right so it's very high cement based mortar uh, sometimes maybe type s but type m mostly so that that seals up those joints right but it doesn't really seal them it just fills them and co causes that surface area to be smooth because that's the other thing you want to have a smooth surface you don't want the frost when the ground freezes to have anything to grab onto so if there was any kind of little ins and outs with the blocks not that there should be it'll grab that and you see how also on the bottom there they've curved it away so that it's any moisture that comes down that wall is going to move away and it's going to go beside the footing and when it goes beside the footing it's going to hit a weeping tile, which the drainage tile or weeping tile carries that water away. So essentially with this sketch here, you've got parging going on. You're going to put damp proofing. You've got it coved out on the bottom, right? And there's going to be a drainage layer that goes along at that point. So that's not enough. Now, this is a poured concrete foundation. I don't have a picture of the block with it, but Here's a picture, a photo I took of um, a poured concrete foundation. Now it's got a bitumous coating. So it does call for a bitumous coating on our specifications for that addition. And that's a spray on, it can be rolled on, but it's generally a spray on. And that is to stop water from permeating through the foundation wall. It's a very strong protection to stop water from moving through. Now it's called damp proofing. So damp proofing is at one level and that's when we don't have hydrostatic pressure present. That's when we excavate the foundation and it's pretty dry like this one is. 
If we excavate and this thing fills with water, then that means we're below the water table. Damp proofing won't work. We'll have to waterproof that foundation, which means a whole bunch of other steps. Uh, a more protective coating that'll have to be put onto the wall. A uh, sump pump will have to be installed on the interior to relieve pressure underneath the slab because water can actually push up the slab. So there'd be a bunch of other things that we have to do. But more typical where, where hydrostatic pressure is not present is what we do is we damp proof. Now you can sort of see around here this piping. That is our drain. That it basically is our weeping tile, all right, or our drainage tile. It's referred to both. Usually, too, we will put a nylon sock over it, or it comes with a nylon sock over it, so that when you backfill, even though you cover it with gravel, we want to stop the sediment, like the clay sediment, from working its way into the piping over time. So we generally have a drain, basically a nylon sock over it. Um, some cases you may not, but generally we do. And that pipe, the drainage layer, I'm sorry, not the drainage layer, the um, weeping tile, it has a lot of serrations. And the idea with the serrations is that when water comes down, say you have a big rain, you do have a lot of water. Like if this just rained now, this would have some water in it, but that's not the same as having hydrostatic pressure where it's just automatically coming up from the ground. We want to get rid of that water. And so that water will more, will more freely fall into the weeping tile and then it's it'll drain away and then this is connected to the storm sewer uh, on the street so this connection here would be on the storm sewer which is connected on the street uh, and takes the water the goal is to always get the water away from the foundation we always want to get the water away from the foundation okay so let's go back to our drawings for a few minutes All right, so we're back and we've got the foundation wall and we've got all of that information. So now I hope that that makes a lot more sense to you where it's saying six millimeter parging. It's about a quarter inch of parging uh, minimum. You can always go a little bit more with that when you're parging it. Uh, concrete block foundation wall. The top course is always filled solid. Number one, uh, we want to have it very solid along the top. Usually they put whatever stuff they have around in the holes so that the top hole course can be filled. And then they drop anchor bolts into the holes that are being filled so that now you can attach your sill plate to it. So that's an important aspect of the sill plate attaches to the foundation wall uh, so that that's really attaching your whole framing for the house and connecting it to that. Let's go back up here and see this is a little bit sideways. So let's flip that around. That's better. This is that section AA that I was telling you about. So you can sort of see here the weeping tile that's in the corner here. You can see the footing that has been placed around. You can see that this is at the same level as the existing house. So we've got this at the same level as the existing house. You can see the gravel that is placed over the weeping tile. So there's uh, about a foot of gravel that is placed over top of the weeping tile so that the water will drain more freely. The backfill is usually whatever backfill was left from the excavation that's put back and then that's put over top of it. Now what I didn't show you yet, I'm just going to go back to our slides here. These are like for a new house footings going in for the whole house before the walls are in place. But this is what I wanted to show you. This is the drainage layer. So that's that cover that goes on. And what that does is it separates basically the moisture buildup that is going to inevitably happen when it rains on the outside. And there may be some hydrostatic pressure during a big rainstorm, but basically the idea is it's stopping water from going through. So you've got that damp proofing on the wall. This is covering over the damp proofing. And then this is going down and coming around the footing so that basically the water will drop. If any gets in through this, it'll drop very quickly and freely down to the weeping tile and the weeping tile will take it away. And then of course we cover this with gravel, all right? So that basically protects the weeping tile. 
And then when we put the backfill against this, it's also got a little bit of flexibility that if anything moves a little bit with frost up and down, it's not going to cause any major problems to the foundation. So really helps us out a lot there. So back at the drawings here, we have that foundation in place with the weeping tile, with the gravel. This is what we were just looking at when we talked about the, the BMEC approved drainage layer material. That's what that's referring to. All right. So that's your foundation wall. That's your foundation wall that's going around the whole house. On drawings, it's shown with a dashed line because that indicates it's below the ground. All right, it's below the ground. We use dashed lines for quite a few things. So it's not just only for what we call hidden lines, something that's behind something like the ground, like these sauna tubes for the deck that are supporting the deck, right? It can be shown for quite a few things. Uh, for example, as I mentioned in the previous video, it's shown dash lines for walls that are to be removed. In the case of our foundation plan, we're going to remove the whole back wall of that house. So that's shown as a dash line to say that's being taken out. This dash line is showing you're going to put a footing here and you're going to have a pipe column. Again, those references, you could refer to number 23 and it'll give you details. Let's do that. Number 23. So we go back down. 23. And it gives you information about the pipe column. The size of the pipe column, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters thickness of the pipe column, top and bottom plate um, that will be onto it, and one meter by one meter by 450 millimeter concrete footing, or 1,000 by 1,000 by 450 millimeter concrete footing. That's telling us the size of the concrete footing. So it's going to be like three feet three inches by about 18 inches thick. It's carrying a concentrated load down through that pipe column because it's supporting the uh, floors on both sides because our floor joists they're going from this direction to that direction and these floor joists and these joists the existing floor joists are going to be supported on four two by twelves four two by twelves on joist hangers so there'll be joist hangers placed on both sides and that's going to be supporting the whole floor and that weight gets transferred to the bearing on this side, the bearing on this side, and on that pipe column. So that's why that's so big, is so that it can transfer those loads over a bigger area so that the soil can support that without any sagging. We don't want things to sag when we're talking about foundations. So it's very, very important that we um, do those elements that way, all right? And so, yeah, so that's kind of our foundation plan. In future ones, we'll take a look at the deck here. We'll look at a few other uh, different um, details. But I thought I'd just get you going on uh, how the hexagons work relating to this foundation, what it is for a block foundation. Now, we do have a fireplace here. I should also mention that, right? And we'll look at that in another. This is showing a solid masonry fireplace. And I can see it's got a full... Uh, masonry fireplace by the hatchings I can tell that going up and if I look at the outside elevations I can see the chimney for that right so I can see the chimney for that and that's for the single flue coming out of the fireplace so we do need large foundations uh, for a solid masonry fireplace unlike what's more common is like a direct vent gas fireplace. We can just direct vent it out the wall. We don't need to have wood that we got to burn and exit out through the chimney. Uh, it's much more efficient with a gas fireplace, uh, but in some rural areas and that sort of thing, they're still uh, reasonably popular, the wood fireplace. But I think today people are a little bit more lazy that they don't chop firewood as much and plus uh, uh, of, of the smoke issue and uh, the labor issues um, that are involved with and the cost. So that's what I wanted to cover for today in this series. Um, please click subscribe and notifications. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment if you have any questions. That's always helpful. And we'll see you next time. I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day and bye for now.